If you are a regular listener to The Sociology Show, then you could help with the costs of promoting and hosting the podcast. If you can spare even a small amount, then you can donate on the GoFundMe.com website by searching for The Sociology Show. There is no obligation, of course, and all future downloads will continue to be free. A huge thank you to all those that have already donated. Your kind gesture will help to continue keep the show going and growing. Best wishes and keep enjoying the show. Hi, you're listening to The Sociology Show, a podcast about absolutely anything to do with the wonderful world of sociology. Whether you're a teacher, a lecturer, a student, or just taking a passing interest, this podcast will look at a range of issues from social class, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, religion, crime, education, and anything else that sociology has to offer. My name is Matthew Wilkin, and in each episode, I will speak to someone working in the field of sociology and let them explain all about their own interests, their research, and their experiences. So, put your earphones in, turn the volume up, and let's be sociology geeks together, eh? Hello, and welcome to The Sociology Show. The Sociology Show podcast is brought to you in association with Tutor to You Sociology, the exam performance specialist for A-level and GCSE sociology students and teachers. And so you can visit their website, which is tutor to you net forward slash sociology and once you're on there you can pick up revision guides revision videos flashcards and everything else that you need for your a-level or gcse sociology studies and so on to this episode and i'm delighted to welcome my guest dr claire markham claire thank you for joining me on the show thank you so claire let's go for it introduce yourself tell us a bit about who you are and what you do so as kind of been alluded to my name's claire um I'm a lecturer in sociology and criminology at Nottingham Trent University. Um, But what I'm going to speak to you about later on today is some of my kind of research areas. And I am particularly interested in rural pubs and their impact on communities and what they mean for communities and what the decline in number actually means for the communities, for people who use the pub and also for wider village sustainability. So I'm kind of interested in why pubs are closing, but more importantly, the impact of that closure on kind of those who use them, but also village identity and what it means for other services within villages. And linked to that is the kind of the sustainability angle of villages more generally and rural areas. So as a sociologist, the rural has tended to be neglected um, overall. So I kind of want to reinvigorate kind of studies around the rural from a sociological perspective and really looking at how we can sustain those areas, both economically, socially and culturally. And and I'm guessing your research is more important than ever at this current time. It is, yeah. And I've got kind of plans going forward to kind of start to look in as how kind of perceptions towards the villages have changed both um, during and post-pandemic and also kind of with the current situation around pub closures in terms of the 10 o'clock and the closures around kind of the second lockdown, what that actually means for the communities who kind of rely on pubs, not necessarily just for kind of drinking. I think this is one thing that really interests me. I'm not a drinker myself, but I engage with the pub for a number of other reasons. So for me, the pub means more than just somewhere to drink. It's somewhere to kind of meet some people. It also has a cultural influence for me and kind of is brilliant for kind of linking the past to the present from a sociological perspective. And I'm always interested what leads people into their research. Are are you from a village area yourself originally, Claire? Yeah, I am. So I've always lived in the county of Lincolnshire. I have loved and loathed living in a village throughout my life and I'll explain that in a little bit more context so I absolutely love living in the rural but before I could drive I hated it okay (laughs) and I'll explain that there was very little public transport where I lived um I couldn't get out anywhere all my friends who kind of lived in my closest town and that were kind of going out. I couldn't go out. I couldn't afford taxis. I was relying on my parents to take me somewhere. And it was genuinely a bit of, 
using the internet but before the internet was kind of really fashionable for meetings and the whole zoom culture had not developed so it was kind of very isolating once I got my car and I was able to drive and able to kind of explore I started to really see the rural in a different light and it was one of these reasons that got me looking into kind of the provision of rural services because it got me thinking about people who either for health reasons have had to surrender their license or kind of for health reasons can no longer go into towns or cities how do they kind of keep their well-being going and kind of this is why I'm interested in both what kind of services provide in terms of kind of goods but also what they can provide villagers and residents that is beyond that and we can see that within the pandemic how kind of you've got that more element of community feel starting to come back yeah and how that plays into kind of people's perceptions of the rural and then I'm interested off the back of that of looking at what it those services mean to people in the context of if they close what's going to happen to those people and I'm also interested because I always ask people when they first encountered sociology, I wondered if you were still living in the rural when you did your GCSEs, A-levels, and then did you move to, to a city for university? So, no, I um, kind of decided to go to my local university, which was the University of Lincoln. And I did both my undergraduate, postgraduate and my PhD at Lincoln. So I kind of tended to kind of... I moved house, but I kind of stayed in the in the kind of the rural villages because for me, I like that peace, that tranquility, that kind of I'm a country girl. And I think I will always be a kind of more resided to the country way of living. I like history. I like culture. And I kind of like just being able to be on the doorstep of miles and miles of countryside. Mm -hmm. um, Lincolnshire is very nice for that anyway, as a general kind of county. And I think for me, again, Lincoln offered me that kind of, it was close enough to go and enjoy some kind of city life. And I'm not far from Nottingham either. So I can enjoy that, but I can also have the country life alongside that. And as I say, from my perspective now, I wouldn't change it. There's things I've changed about living in the rural, like kind of sustainability and kind of inequalities, just like there are in kind of urban areas and kind of the inequalities and poverty and things that are around just as they are in any other area but for me the rural holds something in my heart that kind of attaches me to it and I feel a connection to it and that's really really true what you said about the it's kind of an under-researched and represented area isn't it because most of sociology is about cities urban areas diversity in those big cities and so on is there anyone else studying kind of similar about rural areas about the countryside and small villages and so on so there are other kind of scholars who research this area. Um, however, it tends to be more geographers. Um, it's historically been a geographer's area, kind of the rural kind of has tended to be more kind of developed and kind of honed in. Um, but I think there are kind of a few of us who have kind of got interest in the rural. And I think there are, I know, for example, like when I was at Lincoln, I was doing a project when I was doing my PhD, I met Michael Ward, who I think you've had on the yeah. show before. Yeah. And I know he's done work around kind of rural public transport and things like that and, and kind of things. So there are sociologists who do have an interest in the rural. And I think it's only developed over the last five, ten years. Um, and I think it's still got scope to be explored significantly, particularly in relation to kind of policies sustainability in terms of also the perceptions around what people expect a village to be versus what it actually is when you get there mm. um that was something that very closely came around in my research and something i'm very interested in is how perceptions of what village life is doesn't always match up to the realities when you get there yeah um, so i'm very interested in exploring that as well yeah. And I just wonder as well, um, with the current situation, with so many more people working from home and there's not such this need to be in an urban area or to be in the office or to be in the city, uh, you know, the next few years, that movement out into villages, it could be really significant, couldn't it? It could, yeah. And I think 
we're starting to already see that. We've already seen in the news, for example, over the summer, some of the estate agents saying that kind of people have been starting to look at rural areas. Um, again, that gives me kind of an area to research insofar as has the rural, um, and again, it's you have to think about how the rural is kind of typecast and not all rural areas are the same. Um, but some rural areas, particularly where I live, for example, whilst I've got kind of broadband, my speeds are nowhere near the capabilities that they are when I'm kind of in my work at Nottingham, which lends itself to, again, this idea of how sustainable are the provisions within rural areas to take into account things such as more people working from home and the whole infrastructure around that is kind of still questionable. And I do know there has been research done in the past around kind of broadband speeds and kind of businesses and their kind of relevance within rural areas because of that, which then leads again to questions around if people are more home working, how sustainable is it from a kind of a, a service provision perspective? Thank you, Claire. Should we, should we go a bit more into your own research? Do you want to tell us a, a bit about your methodology and what, what the main focus of your research is then? Yeah, so my research now, I've carried on from my PhD. So my PhD was a grounded theory piece of research and it looked at perceptions and experiences of the village pub from various actors. So it looked at it from pub goers, pub users, to people who don't go to the pubs, people who just live in village areas. And it ranged from people who had just turned 18, 19, 20-ish, to people who were in their 90s. And my research in particular looks at how they perceived and experienced the pub, the village pub, over their kind of life course and how they kind of link that towards what the pub means to them. So I did 66 interviews in relation to that. And off the back of that, I created, obviously, kind of my thesis. And I have a chapter around the economic role of pubs, the social role of pubs, and the cultural role of pubs as kind of participants see, saw them. So it kind of it makes use of kind of um, Bordeaux's work in terms of capital and kind of taking those three things as capital, social capital, economic capital, and cultural capital. And my thesis explored how those capitals interact with each other to help both sustain kind of village pubs, but also can work against each other. So off the back of that, as an example, um, I spoke to some people who had gone to the pub all their life and suddenly then the culture of the place changed in terms of atmosphere, in change of landlord in change of name that dissuaded them from going because they didn't like the cultural changes mm. had an impact on how much time they went there they stopped spending money there and kind of then their social life kind of declined so automatically I was beginning to see some links between the three different kind of capitals and how they interact with each other and how they can work both to the benefit of pubs and individuals but also how they can work if they're not kind of thought of as a three partnership element how it can kind of impact negatively on um, pubs and village services so off the back of that once my um, data was in and I'd analysed it all I thought about what could my thesis offer as well as a kind of contribution to knowledge and I set aside, well, I set aside at the time, a chapter in my thesis all along what kind of potential methods rural pubs in Lincolnshire could potentially use to help them try and sustain themselves. I stress that it's kind of all my research is based on Lincolnshire. So some of the kind of practice examples I've given in my work would only be probably relevant to Lincolnshire. They may have sign of some relevance at other places, but I specifically talk about Lincolnshire pubs and the kind of the Lincolnshire economy, the Lincolnshire kind of context, shall we say, of kind of how the village pubs are and the fact that only the ones near the East Coast are kind of near the seaside resorts. So different measures for different pubs. Um, 
so I offered a kind of contribution to practice in my thesis as well as a contribution to knowledge. And it's that particular latter part that has in recent years kind of become quite a high bit of focus of my work. So when I was at Lincoln University, I was fortunate enough to be offered one of the university public engagement grants. And off the back of that, I was able to go around and run some seminars where I could invite kind of publicans or communities who were wanting to buy their pub and I could talk about my research and my findings from that and as a result of that I've got to know quite a few more landlords and kind of engage with those and I've been able to write things off the back of that such as a conversation piece that I wrote earlier in this year about how some places can use history and heritage to help sustain their pubs so I see kind of my role if that's the right word, in relation to kind of my research as a way to kind of connect the academic world with the real world. And my kind of element within that is to help people give their own voice, people who are in rural areas, their voice, people who are pub users, a voice to kind of then kind of say, look, this is happening this might work, it might not work, but they are things that we can do. And also to showcase the importance of kind of the rural pub. That's not to say that everything in my work shows the pub in a positive light all the time. It doesn't. If we look historically at pubs, we know there are issues around inequalities. We know there are issues around patriarchy mm. and kind of cultures within those spaces. Okay. And I think, one of the things that my work does is it tries to show that actually these have always been there and that we can work within those parameters to still create, there's still something that we as a society hold dear about pubs and rural pubs in particular. And those divisions have always been there and there are different divisions now. So for example, in my thesis, I talk around how, some of the class divisions have been kind of blurred with length of residency divisions. So the whole idea of, are you local kind of thinking back to the league of gentlemen back in the yeah. day yeah. That kind of element, they're still there, but pubs can become more kind of diverse. And we're seeing that we've seen it historically with kind of families going in more. We've seen it more as foods become yeah. kind of more of a space for kind of more of a family space rather than the traditional male dominated area. So it's kind of thinking about how can we capitalize on that? But what's interesting from my work running under long, all of this is how people expect, the village pub to be versus how it is and this idea that I come up in my thesis and I kind of run with quite a lot is people expect a hybrid really yeah. so this kind of mix between some of the old facets of the traditional pub like for example the last orders bell the swinging sign mm -hmm. the open fire but then you want it mixed with some of the modern comforts of today so the kind of the food the kind of the real ale, the kind of the comfy seating rather than the spit and the sawdust. So we've got this kind of situation where we're after a hybrid and it's difficult to kind of then place that in kind of what is reality because obviously that was never reality, but they're what people want. And often that's linked to kind of what people have seen or their pre-existing preconceptions. So it's kind of mixing out what people want versus what is reality. Yeah. And that's kind of some of the harder, trickier parts of my research to actually knock down to it. And you can see through a lot of my analysis and a lot of my research that different people have different ideas. So for example, some of my participants who were, older and kind of lived in the village all their life they tended to view the pub through kind of rose tinted glasses mm. that they talk about the positives of it but they kind of glossed over the more negative like it being a male dominated space and it being spit and sawdust they're in favor of talking about how they would meet their mates after work kind of in there and it was the place that we all went they kind of spoke about that side of it more than the kind of what they knew was happening, but didn't want to really confront, if that makes sense. Yeah. 
It's, it's really interesting as well that you say that kind of spit and sawdust because my perception, and I'm intrigued to know if other people thought this as well, when you, when you say village or rural pub, to me, maybe this is a result of that I live in Sussex, but I always think of somewhere quite quite posh, actually, um, quite middle class, uh, you know, nice open fireplace, traditional ales on the taps. But actually, a lot of rural pubs, village pubs, that's, that's not the case at all. In fact, far from it, right? Yeah. And you it, again, it falls into kind of some of the more historical work of, of pubs and like historians like Paul Jennings are particularly good at this with his book on the local showing you that actually in a lot of rural areas, traditionally, there's been more than one pub and different yeah. classes have gone to different pubs. So this has been like the kind of the land workers pub and this is the landowners pub. But what's interesting is, as kind of the pubs have closed in number, is you've got that merging under the same roof. But even within that kind of merging, there's still separate spaces within the the pub itself. So even though now we've got rid of a lot of, I mean, some pubs still have the snug and the bar areas, which are obviously physically partitioned. But even those that haven't have still got an element of kind of where different people sit. Yeah. And we can still see that. And I think that's one of the things that my work kind of tries to show is that, yes, the pub is an area where social gatherings and social space, and it is a key, important social space, particularly in rural areas. But it also retains elements of kind of inequalities and divisions within it. Mm. And it's recognising that alongside what people want again and, and kind of bringing in, and even to the point of where you start to look at food, is if you've got a kind of a good menu, but it's a high price menu, you might be excluding people by default of not being able to afford those prices. So it's kind of like looking what people want, but kind of making it accessible to them at the same time, which isn't always easy to do. And, and I think one of the things that particularly comes quite striking a lot from my research is how much value people place on things such as the name of the pub whether it's got a swing inside open fires were constantly um talked about in my research yeah. yeah now what's interesting with that is lincolnshire still has quite a high proportion of areas that have got open fires i'm i have one in my own house for example that's been there all my life it's still kind of a, a dominant fuel type around here So it's expected that pubs and that will have them. But obviously running alongside everything, things like coal fires are dirty fuels and have impacts on the environment. So we've got this now from a sustainability perspective is you want something, but also that has an impact on the environment, which we're trying to address as well. So we're now getting into realms of kind of complexities between different elements. And it's quite interesting to watch. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. That's going to be the end of part one. In part two, we're going to carry on the discussion about your research on rural pubs. Hi, welcome back to part two of the Sociology Show. I'm talking to Dr. Claire Markham, talking about rural pubs. One of the questions I'm quite interested in, Claire, you mentioned that many pubs have either changed or had to close. When, when did we start to see that occurring? Was there a sort of a, a key time in history where we started to notice that, that movement? I think, I mean, one of the things I did in my thesis was put together a kind of review of the literature around kind of the decline of pubs in numbers. And I think there's a whole range of factors that come into play. I think you've got things such as people's changing in leisure time people kind of from the 70s 60s and 70s had more leisure time they were starting to get into the realms where there was more disposable income towns and cities and the development of the nighttime economies were starting to really kind of take shape from kind of the 70s onwards and you started to get that and I think at that point the pub was starting to be overlooked as a site of kind of entertainment as a site of leisure and it started to take on a slightly different role in people's lives by which case I mean I know like when I was growing up some people went to the village pub as a kind of a preloading event before going into town so it was somewhere there you met your friends had a drink and then went into town as I've kind of got older I've seen that kind of the village pubs have tended to have a big market around food 
And I think they've remarketed themselves in relation to that. And I think they're key factors. But I also think there are issues around kind of policies around government legislation and there are debates around the kind of the beer tie and the pub tie. And there's lots of factors. And I think it's the fact that all those things have come together and add an impact. I don't think there's, for me, there's any one thing that can be pinpointed to say this has led to the decline. I think there's a whole range of factors going from consumer behaviour to kind of policies through to more general transferences and kind of developments within the kind of the cultural marketplace, so to speak. Yeah. So, and also underlying that, I think there's also changes in kind of the wider society and the sociological kind of transference of people kind of now commuting to work rather than living and working in the same kind of five mile five six mile locality so particularly in the area of Lincolnshire when I was kind of interviewing my participants they were saying for them they all worked kind of within two or three miles and they the pub was their natural kind of place to meet I think now with people having more kind of diverse lifestyles and kind of work in different places that's kind of led to it I mean I think for me what's interesting is as you alluded to with the home working is will it kind of then come full circle again yeah I don't know I, I'd be interesting to see um but I think with pubs the ones that have kind of survived the closures and survived kind of to today are the ones that have taken it upon themselves to offer more than just drink and kind yeah. of actively offer more. So not just food, but also kind of we can see library spaces being put in there. We can see what um, Wi-Fi spaces. We can see delivery services. And also where the landlord or landlady or whatever has kind of become embedded within that community themselves. Yeah. So rather than being a kind of a tenant of a pub co, like, for example, a manager of Weatherspoons just off the top of my head or a manager of any of those kind of things where the landlord or landlady are part of the community themselves and they've embedded themselves within that community to become a face that is more than just that pub if that makes sense yeah that they become intrigued intrinsically linked with that village and people know them and they see them walking their dog for example or whatever and that kind of community feel alongside of it and that's that's really what interesting what you said about how significant a, a change of hands can be as well you know if a pub becomes gentrified or a bistro starts offering food when previously it was a spit and sawdust pub that can have a massive effect on a village particularly if it's the only pub or or, or only nearby pub for a lot of people yeah and it kind of that was something that came out very heavily within my work and some of the people i got to interview were kind of talking about the back in the kind of 80s and when the kind of the big six and the beer orders and things like that that they kind of the changing of the corporate identity coming through that was a big persuasion for them to kind of limit how often they went to the pub and one of the things that came out very strikingly was if landlords kept changing kind of either the pub or the name it could kind of signal kind of to them that it was no longer their local. So there was kind of, there were people who attached the, their, the kind of the village pub they kind of used as their local. Yeah. It was like they put a kind of an ownership to it. And when it kind of changed, it was like, well, it's no longer my local anymore. I don't really want to go. <laughs> so it kind of dissuaded people from going. Part, um, of, part of people's identity really, isn't it? Their pub. And I think that's it. I think a lot of kind of people spoke about how the pub has kind of particularly older people and the older generations who had used the pubs a lot more than they used. So particularly the older men I, for example, interviewed, they were talking about how the pub kind of for them offers them a connection to their past and kind of offers them kind of times to reminisce and kind of also go there now with their families for a meal so there was this recognition that the kind of the role of the pub in terms of how they use it has changed and they didn't have a problem with that insofar as where before they go and stand at the bar and have a drink now they'll go with their families and have a meal and they kind of recognize that as their life moved on that was a natural progression and those sort of changes were kind of more accepted what tended not to be more accepted was the, was things like changing of names and changing of signs and the removal of kind of 
the more historic things like the last orders bell um things like that were remarked on to me that they were very important imagery facets that kind of made the pub a pub yeah um so it fell very much into that and that's the part of my research now that i'm kind of really starting to develop out on and think about the cultural relevance and how important the cultural side of the pub is and also in relation to if pubs close what history and heritage is also being lost so and how that can impact on the village identity more broadly it's really reminded me of, I'm going to give such a mundane example, but there's an episode of Men Behaving Badly from the 90s where the Crown Pub shuts down and the two lead characters, Gary and Tony, have to search for a new pub. And, and they kind of grade everything. What's the pint like? What's the barmaid like? Do they sell peanuts? Is there a fruit machine? And it's, sort yeah. of, it's just really reminding me of that, that there's kind of, it's almost a tick list of what people envisage should be in their local pub. Yeah. And one of the things that certainly came across in mine was in my research kind of and in my public engagement events that I've run post PhD is this idea that some people assume it's going to be like the wall pack off Emmerdale <laughs> yeah. where everybody in the village goes and it's all friendly and it's kind of all this. And yes, there is an element of that because pubs are social spaces but in reality, only a small percentage of people from villages actually tend to use the pub for kind of on a regular basis for kind of drinking. Yeah. It tends to have more of a kind of aesthetic appeal to people and as a place to go when there's kind of weddings or kind of events, celebratory events. And it was almost like it was taken for granted, like a village isn't a village without a pub. And um, this element that, actually as long as the pub's there it'll always be there and I think one thing that I'm kind of keen to show in my research is that out of the 25 villages that appeared in my research pretty much all of them had seen a decline in the number of pubs mm. from kind of the 20th century onwards and it was kind of like from that what does that really mean for those who do still use them and I'm also interested because you said about changes in consumer behavior, because there's a lot of research that shows, you know, the under 25, for example, are less likely to drink. A lot of people are making a lifestyle choice not to take on alcohol. There does seem to be a, a movement away from that. Do you think that's going to have a significant impact as well? I think it could. But I think here there's real scope um, for development. And I say that, so one of the organisations that I'm aware of and kind of have kind of been speaking to is Club Soda. Yeah. And for those who don't know, Club Soda is kind of all around kind of sustaining kind of low or kind of no alcohol drinking and, and kind of promoting kind of non-alcoholic or low alcoholic drinks. And I think there's a real scope within the kind of the marketplace of the pub to actually use that to help its sustainability mm. and i say this particularly with my own kind of lived experience of the rural there are many times when i want to kind of go to a pub for a meal or at christmas and with the drink driving laws obviously you can't drink and drive okay you've got all these other factors going in which leads me then either to have pretty normally a coke a lemonade or kind of one of the standard soft drinks that we would expect. Okay. And I think kind of with this kind of push towards kind of people going kind of either for a stoptober or kind of people not wanting the alcohol, I think there's real scope for pubs to kind of, as well as kind of their alcohol offerings, extend their kind of soft drink offerings. Yeah. And I think that could really kind of help the marketplace. And it's something that I, I'm very interested in doing some research in, in relation to how kind of the remarketing and the kind of the rebranding and kind of the, the more accessibility of kind of different low and soft alcohol drink, um, non-alcohol drinks could kind of be used to help sustain pubs. Yeah. So that's kind of something that I'm really interested in and looking at kind of doing some work in the future around. 
Yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a pub near me that actually their lunchtime, it's almost an extension of a cafe. It's very busy, but the uh, majority of people are having teas or coffees. So, you know, it doesn't have to just be a focal point of alcohol, does it? No, and I, and I think that's where a lot of my research comes in. So as I've said in kind of part one, I myself, I'm not a, a kind of a, an alcohol drinker. Um, I might have the occasional gin and tonic, but by and large, if I go to a pub, I will 99.9% of the times have a tea, coffee or soft drink. Um, that's my personal preference. But what I can still do within those spaces is enjoy the company of others, is kind of have a meal. I can meet friends in there who I probably wouldn't be meeting otherwise. So it gives me that space to kind of take myself away from the kind of the house or the office space. So it's a different space. And within that space, there is that kind of natural kind of ability to socialize if that's what you want to do there's also well the thing that I quite like about pubs from my perspective is many a time um we, especially pubs that have kind of offer wi-fi and that yes. to be able to go in there and kind of sit with my laptop and do some quiet work so almost like I would do with some of the coffee shops I've been known to do that with some of the village pubs around me as well, particularly when I was writing up my thesis. It was quite nice because it was quiet, but it was a space that kind of, you could see there was interaction going on, but you didn't, if you wanted to be part of that interaction with the kind of the, the bar person, you could be, but you didn't have to be. So it was kind of almost having that friendly face around you, but also having the ability to work as well. So I think there are opportunities to kind of for pubs to develop and sustain and how that can link to the wider village life more generally. Because again, we have to look at some of the kind of the negative realities of, of living in villages for some people, that some people can't have the internet or don't have the kind of the ability to afford the internet. And it might be that they have the devices, but they don't have the internet. And if the pubs can provide Wi-Fi, and people can therefore, it offers that another connection to the outside world that people might not have been able to get otherwise. Yeah. Do you, do you think that is the, the future of pubs, Claire? Maybe this could, could be the last question. Do you think that's the way pubs are going to go in the future? I think pubs will always kind of try and diversify. And I think they, they know, they've learned over the years that they need to in order to keep going. Mm. And we've seen that. We've seen that with kind of how kind of historically food has not played a part within pubs very rarely to it come in being kind of a staple for many pubs obviously there are some that are still wet lead and there'll always be I think a place for some wet lead pubs um but I think going forward pubs are having to look about as changes are happening in wider society as more people are choosing like you said earlier on not to drink well how can we capitalize on that what can we offer kind of instead of that and kind of again my work is looking um one of the things that I'm particularly interested in like I said was the non-alcohol drinks but also kind of how history and heritage can be used to help kind of pubs diversify in maybe a different way to what they have historically done mm. agreed agreed and I, I really do hope that this pandemic does not continue to shut too many i know it's going to have an inevitable effects for some but uh, let's hope it's not too damaging for all yeah i would totally agree with that thank you claire could i ask you just to, to finish off by telling us your details if people want to get in touch or add you on twitter where else can they read more about your work yeah so you can find me on twitter under that username cultural claire claire without the eye on there you can also get in touch with me through my email address, which is claire.markham at ntu.ac.uk. And kind of I'm, I'm pretty much always on my email, so you can contact me that way. But Twitter is a good way to get hold of me, to be fair. Brilliant. Thank you so much for your time today, Claire. I really appreciate it. Thank you. If you are a regular listener to The Sociology Show, then you could help with the costs of promoting and hosting the podcast. If you can spare even a small amount, then you can donate on the GoFundMe.com website by searching for The Sociology Show. There is no obligation, of course, and all future downloads will continue to be free. A huge thank you to all those that have already donated. Your kind gesture will help to continue keep the show going and growing. Best wishes and keep enjoying the show. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the podcast. 
If you would like to contact the show or be interviewed, then please email the Sociology Show Podcast at gmail.com.